Whew. It's been a wee bit of a long journey. I'm not quite over the jet lag yet, especially as I think some noisy archaeologists came into the hotel about half past three this morning. So um, <laughs> okay, yeah. they may not have been archaeologists, but there was definitely some archaeological talk. So um, <laughs> that's all I'm going to say. Uh, it. Right. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, good day, I should say as well. Um, obviously, you can tell by the accent, I'm not a Kiwi, born and bred in Surrey. Uh, I left uh, the UK archaeology in about 2007, so I've been out of the country for about eight, nine years. Um, and in the last three years, I've been practicing, back practicing field archaeology and many other types of archaeology and heritage um, in a wee place called Dunedin on the South Island of, Dun um, of New Zealand. I'll introduce Dunedin a little bit later. Um, but really, um, what my kind of presentation is about is to give you a very quick, very light snapshot of uh, a little bit about New Zealand archaeology to just give you some background context, um, and then really straight into uh, the idea of beer and brewing in New Zealand. Uh, now, I'm not going to talk about beer, so I'm not going to get your expectations up and so I'm going to talk about hops and things. I'm actually going to talk about some archaeological projects that I've been involved in the last two years um, that kind of give two very different aspects of, of brewing in New Zealand, but very much from a sociocultural, um, dare we use a colonial from um, a trade commodity and consumption perspective. It's a wee bit light because it's difficult to fit into 20 minutes. Um, and just in case anybody's confused, um, yeah, we used to be Jackie Gillies and Associates. We're a five-person um, uh, consultancy. Uh, and we're now called Origin, which is our new colours. Two weeks ago. Exciting. Right, let's if I can go the right way. Um, right, so, yeah, yeah, one of the things we dig up um, on a quite literally a day-to-day -day basis, we have, strange enough, a very broad, um, you might say, uh, archaeological archive or assemblage in New Zealand, but we have certain things that keep coming up again and again, and that's because... Um, New Zealand um, heritage um, is both small, but from a legislative perspective and a social perspective. Um, and we basically have two types of archaeology. We have uh, pre-colonial or pre-European, the, the names literally in flux at the moment how this is described in language. But basically we have um, pre-settlement um, uh, from the 1840s uh, period. So before then we basically have Maori uh, archaeology and then after that, 1840s onwards, um, pretty much into the early 20th century, we have European settlement um, archaeology. So um, and that's our basic sort of cultural framework, how archaeologists work sort of day to day. I work pretty much purely in the, the European um, historical archaeological field. Um, I'm going to go into my background in the UK, but it's a bit of an interesting learning curve because I hadn't dug anything younger than about 1500 before moving out to New Zealand, so suddenly going to the 18, sort of 50s and 1880s was quite interesting. So we have a lot of bottles, and we have a lot of boots, uh, and that picture at the end is actually Dunedin in the 1860s, uh, in the early settler, early settler city. Um, and basically uh, Dunedin, um, like other towns that developed in New Zealand, was heavily influenced by the sort of the, the immigrant population. And in our case, you might get from the name it's Scottish, and we we pride we they pride ourselves on being the most Scottish town outside of Scotland. And I kid you not, I've seen more kilts and bagpipes where I live than I think I've ever seen in my trips to Scotland. And that's you know uh, they take it very seriously. Um, and actually, it's fantastic. It's, it's quite been interesting. It's quite interesting. Um, so, uh, basically, in terms of legislation, um, I was going to talk lots about this, but I won't now. It's not really relevant. Um, but we do have um, uh, a system not unlike the UK system, but effectively, rather than through the planning system, uh, our archaeology basically comes from what will be sort of the equivalent of English heritage. So we basically have one body that, that manages and implements and curates one act, um, and it's the... Uh, Heritage New Zealand Puhiri Tayona, the half English, half Māori, uh, Act 2014. And actually it changed so two years ago. Um, so we're all getting to grips with the changes because like a lot of other people, we actually lost heritage through that legislation. We're also being quite pressured into what we can and can't do. Um, right, so no further ado, uh, New Zealand beer and brewing. A very much a taste of the old country, unsurprising. Um, when you have uh, Scottish, Irish and English, um, i.e. British, settlers coming in, they bring their world with them. Um, and the history of beer, uh, beer in 19th century New Zealand is very much split between uh, large quantities of imported beers, mainly from Britain, so we have bitters, ales, porters, stouts, 
um, and well-established brands such as Tenants, Bass and Guinness, just to name a few, um, to say the least. Um, and then we also have the rapid establishment and growth of small breweries uh, in the new colony, uh, which actually became independent from New South Wales in 1841. Uh, for example, uh, Ryan 2010 um, suggests that there were between 50 and 70 small breweries, and these were mainly one or two person breweries, attached to a pub, um, attached to an inn, um, you know, across the, across the two islands, operating at various times between the late 1850s and late 1860s. Um, in, for those who may, may not be familiar with New Zealand history, um, pretty much from the beginning of the 1850s is when the, the bulk of the population started to, to, to emigrate over, um, which was particularly triggered by the 1862 gold rush, uh, which had come from uh, the Victorian fields of Australia, which in turn had come from San Francisco. So you actually had a very international, you know, we, we talk about the English and Scottish, but actually, South Island in particular was very international, and with it, it brought its different drinking cultures uh, and different um, trade connections and different imports. Um, so, to give an idea of the scale of beer imports into New Zealand from the 1850s, um, the basic government statistics show that in 1860, over 312,000 sounds a hell of a lot to me—312,000 gallons of ale and beers plus a few ciders uh, were imported. Uh, by 1867, this had grown to over 718,000 gallons in the year, and that very much reflected the, the huge boom in the population increase. However, from the 1870s onwards, um, the production of domestic New Zealand beers actually began to basically rise from imported beers. Um, and things are uh, hot, I mean, we talked about the hops just actually just previously. Um, the Nelson, so the top of the South Island, um, Show you that in a minute. Um, the Nelson, Marlborough, and Blenheim region actually um, is sitting basically at a, at, a, at a geographical point that's ideal for hot production. Um, and it was, it was quite soon that that became the centre of basically historic New Zealand hot production. And that's actually, it's, it's come and gone, but basically it's come back again. Um, and now we're actually, I believe, we're in, in exporting more than we actually now use domestically. There's a bit of a, bit of a fight. Um, so there was this huge uh, growth in New Zealand breweries. Um, now, there's a, a distinct pattern between both the North and the South Island cities and, the, and their, their brewery patterns. Um, you had a lot of small breweries, but very few actually survived into mature, sort of larger, bigger production um, breweries. So in the cities, many breweries developed that were subject to merger and or failure. It's very common to somebody set up a brewery, two or three years later, it's down the tubes, they start another one up. You know, it's an adventure to venture, basically. Um, but this pattern of sort of collapse and, and just slow amalgamation basically left several dominant breweries by the 1880s. These included the Dominion and Lime breweries, uh, sorry, breweries in, too much beer, in Auckland, the Crown Brewery in Christchurch, uh, and Spates Brewery in Dunedin. Um, the majority of the markets were very local or regional. Spates, however, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, was one of the few exceptions and actually in its early business life exported to North Island, which is quite, quite exotic, but actually also exported to Australia. And we had some very strong trade routes between um, New Zealand and Australia. So it's a regular, you know, we weren't just completely cut off from the world. Um, the, there was constant backwards and forwards between Australia, Sydney, New South Wales, and New Zealand. So, so oh, I'm up at last. So, we do need them. You hear me say we a lot, put that up in the eight years. Uh, we're down here, so we're right on the southeast coast. Um, Auckland, you see, and that's unfortunately I actually cut off our capital city, Wellington, to do my, my PowerPoint. Um, so Wellington's kind of in the middle, bottom of the North Island. Um, and this is just a little bit of a, a kind of iconography of, of beer uh, from the 19th century. Um, just down the road where I used to live when I was a, a, a student uh, was the Berks, uh, Berks Brewery, um, which actually completely burnt down uh, actually in the 1880s. It was a short-lived but very popular brewery. Um, and you have, this is uh, Strachan's uh, Victoria Brewery, one of the many brewery, one of the many in uh, Dunedin. So by 1878, um, 1878, Dunedin breweries were dominant in New Zealand production, uh, with Burke's Brewery, Marsh and Copeland's, uh, Water of Leith Brewery, Strachan and Company's Victoria Brewery, and James Spaten Company uh, breweries around Dunedin. And Dunedin was acknowledged as the brewing capital of New Zealand. Um, and at the time, um, Dunedin was also the first, um, it was never the capital city, but effectively it was the first main city uh, before Auckland and Wellington. So actually, even though we're, we're small, very touristy nowadays, we had a natural harbour that basically was recognised early, early on um, and actually fitted on a lot of the existing trade routes, both to Australia, as I said, but also to America. So um, it was quite, quite, a, quite an important place. 
So moving straight on, um, Spate. Has anybody here heard of Spate? So who have yeah? Has anyone ever really tried Spate? Especially the, yeah, it's a good idea. Good idea. Not to try Spate. Um, Spate, no, the reason I'm saying this is, um, and I will come back to this at the end, Spate's Gold Medal Ale, that's basically what they made their name on. Um, and the ale that they produced um, in the 18, um, 70s, 1880s was their, literally the first of the gold medal winning ales. They went to Australia, um, I do believe they actually went to some of the international exhibitions in, in the UK as well, in Great Britain. Um, there, somebody pointed out to me only a few days ago before I left was the, the Spates Gold Medal Air, which is the current modern badge. Um, it's what they term as a swill beer, which is a lovely term, um, which basically means it's, it's the cheap and nasty. Um, it's what the students in Tennessee drink. We have a, we're a university city um, with a quite a distinctive beer culture, and it's not a drinking culture, um, which gets us on TV on a regular basis, unfortunately. <laughs> the wrong reasons, if you've ever heard of couch burning, I don't know if you get it over here, but. Um, we, 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 they invented a couch burning, it's a big thing um, amongst right. the students. We run out of couches sometimes, so, um, <laughs> but, uh, but because this is cheap um, and makes them very cheerful, <laughs> Spate's actually still surviving, this is actually really important in, in their domestic, um, domestic market, so though I, I jest, it's actually very, very important. Um, so, uh, James Spate and Company, um, basically the brewery was founded in 1876 um, uh, by Dawson Grease and James Spate himself. And the city brewery has strong and numerous competition in Dunedin. But basically it was one of the few early breweries that actually survived and expanded um, and eventually actually expanded to Christchurch uh, and outfits on the North Island as well. Now the development of brewing technology on the site was very much driven by the commercial success, success that in terms reflected in the rapid expansion of the site over a 25 year plus period. Um, so form and function very, mo- very much went hand in hand on a very narrow, confined and a very hilly site as well. Um, which, that picture doesn't quite show it. Um, and the form of its buildings were very much adapted as the changing brewing processes demanded. And we know this very much from uh, a lot of historical work we've done. Now, Spates uh, and the archeological record. The reason I'm talking about Spates is because in 2011, uh, Christchurch, which was actually the main brewing uh, centre for Lions, Lion Brewers, who actually own Spades, um, obviously suffered in the earthquake uh, dramatically and devastatingly. Uh, and effectively, most of it got flattened. So they had to basically very rapidly ramp up what was going on down in Dunedin, which was pretty much a, a by water at the time. And they decided to, rather than rebuild the brewery, in Christchurch, they'd actually sink X amount of million dollars into basic revamping Spades. The main problem was, Spades is a historic brewery, it's a historic site. Uh, we also have, uh, much like the American system, people are in this morning, um, it's a designated historic place. Uh, you know, it's on Category 1, uh, historic place. Um, so it was going to be complicated from an archaeological perspective. Uh, and from the building's archaeology and below ground because confined site, they basically had to revamp it from the inside out, do some demolitions, uh, but still on this, this site. So uh, effectively, we did a uh, assessment, uh, which led to a lot of uh, building recording, which led to, which is where I came in, just as I started in practice back again, um, after university, um, a lot of below, below ground excavation um, in very confined, very deep down and very muddy Dunedin used to be called Mud Eden. Well, it's still occasionally, for real, for, for, still occasionally resembles that, especially when you're excavating, um, as you'll see from my other project as well. So basically, um, the site posed a whole load of challenges, but it was particularly significant for two reasons. Um, one was that the site contained. I'll go back. Sorry, the site contained. Uh, four key areas of uh, historic building, sorry, historic fabric, uh, the cells office 1888, cellar 1 1882, fermentation building in the middle, and cellar 3, which is actually the site of the former molten kilns, which had been redeveloped and, and kind of bastardised, from a better expression, um, into uh, a, a modern chiller kind of cellar building. Um, so basically we were having to record these uh, prior to then effectively being not demolished, but substantially altered, and most particularly earthquake strengthened, which, strengthened, which in uh, New Zealand involves basically lining everything with steel, reinforcing, and then shockcrete, shockcreting it, so you basically blast it with concrete, which meant that we had to recover as much data as possible because we would not see it again. And if, building, if this building was ever taken down or collapsed, it wouldn't be 
capable of being taken down carefully in an archaeological way, it would be destroyed. It simply wasn't possible. I uh, had lots of discussions about that with the authorities, but that's the way they did it. Um, so, the two, so that was one of the significance. The second part of the significance was actually the site itself. It was beyond the fabric, in a sense, from the archaeology. It was the fact that the site itself represented continuous production of beer and brewing from 1876 to the present day. And that, that's actually unique in New Zealand. No other brewery can actually claim that. There's a few historic breweries around New Zealand, the North Island, but they haven't been continuous. They've been used for something else or they're now used for you know, other purposes. So actually, the Spates Brewery is quite literally unique in New Zealand. So um, we, we try to stress that very much in our recording and our, and our processes. The type of archaeology we found, um, and again, I'm just going to go a wee bit briefly, um, wasn't actually that much. We had the buildings um, and a lot of detail of alterations in the buildings, which we recorded. Um, interpretation was a separate thing. Um, below ground, we had evidence for the Moulton Kilns foundations. We had... Um, Lots of cobbled, very basic cobbled floor surfaces, you know, not really glamorous archaeology in a sense. Uh, and the buildings, what was left, had been so altered that it was very difficult to interpret them. Um, interestingly, the cultural material record, um, as we call it, so basically the, the archaeological uh, assemblage um, material, was very slim. They kept the site clean, which posed another problem because we basically were expecting also to do an interpretation um, into the existing historic tour, which we'll talk about heritage at the end. Um, to host tourism, uh, and we found pretty much nothing that anybody would ever want to to you know, display. So that caused a bit of an issue as well. The one refuse feature, um, which basically turned out to be a, a late uh, well, a late twentieth century clean up of some early twentieth century bottles, and none of them were beer; they were all aerated waters. So that didn't really set us alight. So we had some other issues. Um, so this is just. Um, Step away at the top. So this is all our cobbles. Uh, that's actually the Cedarwon Kiln Foundation, which actually was the neatest piece of archaeology. Um, and in <coughs> true New Zealand developer tradition, um, we literally excavated that in a day because we had people waiting to pour concrete onto us. And <coughs> even in the UK system, you normally can buy a little bit of time. We, we don't have that. It's not a culture that we've managed as archaeologists to develop yet. Um, I'm working on it, but it's still times when best practice is an ideal as opposed to what we can actually salvage. It's almost back to the old idea, 30 years ago, salvage of it. Don't get me into that one. We found one neat, very completely surprising feature, however, uh, which was really, we had no records of, no inference, was we actually found a below ground water tank that was uh, about, to feet, um, about five metres deep, um, reinforced concrete surface that was about a metre below other uh, deposits. Um, beautifully brick built, uh, all, all lined out, just, just of it. And the bottom had like a sump, and basically it was, a, um, it was seated on a natural spring line. And Spates is also famous for the fact that it uses natural spring water, which quite literally is on the side. There's two springs. Um, they still use that water now. Um, and this was obviously a tank that had retained that water. And it's amazing. You can see the pump coming down. And when we found it, it was full of water. We pumped it out. And myself and another um, colleague had the privilege of going down after they broke through the, the concrete uh, roof. Um, and then they stopped pumping, and then within about 10 minutes, we suddenly thought, hang on a second, and it literally, it worked. <laughs> so from a health and safety perspective, we were all harnessed, so it was very safe, but from a health and safety perspective, it was a wee bit of a, we realised that, you know, that it was a very active spring, and basically it had, um, um, yeah, it was, it was self-leveling, there's a technical term for it, but basically it would never overflow, and obviously in, in the old days, they actually took this water off, so it's just fantastic, and actually it's been backfilled, so that is preserved. So, um, now probably more a series of questions than, than answers. Um, so, the evidence for brewing archaeology. So, the archaeology provided evidence of physical changes in site's development um, from the 1870s through to the early 20th century, which very much reflected uh, technological and commercial drivers that were known from the historical records. Um, so, we basically in interwove those to produce our interpretation, our reports. But for me, the conundrum was very much this, that later and current brewery operations and development have very much obscured and removed um, a lot of the earlier archaeological historic evidence, which meant we couldn't really actually make sense of it. We relied on historic information, kind of about face to how we would normally do buildings archaeology, um, because we really just, we just you couldn't make sense because there'd been too many interventions uh, and things had basically been obscured as well. And it left me with the question of, 
with all the archaeological evidence we did produce, um, did it actually tell us about Spate's Brewery? So we had archaeology, archaeological evidence, but what did it tell us about Spate's Brewery? Um, the historic information didn't, and my answer is uh, basically no, I don't think it actually did. I mean, that's going to be honest with you, it didn't. You know, I've done many building projects in the UK and other projects where, yes, it has, but it leads to my second question. So in a historical archaeological brewing context, um, is there far more complexity and rapid change in brewing uh, and breweries than archaeological methods can actually te- detect? Um, and I've left it as a question mark because my feeling is actually probably yes in this specific context when you're looking at um, you know, a late 19th century context and I, my, my feeling is this goes to the UK it's not just New Zealand because it's a very similar type of archaeology um, basically, basically you, know, you need this combination of sources you need more than just the archaeology to actually understand the, the, the archaeological um, you know, sort of interpretation of, of brewing um, from, a, from a structural perspective so, rapidly moving on, my second um, kind of rather strange, um, yeah, rather st- I will run over probably about two minutes, so. um, strange, uh, strange other project which uh, takes you to a different time scale. Um, anyone heard of Emerson's beer? No, 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 right, that's okay. Emerson's uh, is a very young brewery. It was founded in 1992 by a lovely man called Richard Emerson and his family. Started from his garage, uh, they actually now have a small brewery just I can't tell you where it is, uh, just across the way from where we're actually now building a new brewery. So they're actually, um, they were actually bought by Lions, who also own Spates. Um, and very much were a microbrewery that's actually done good. They're probably one of the most popular brands of microbreweries, beers in New Zealand. Um, very much a, I use the word boutique, but people kind of you know, poo-poo me. But, um, but it's, it's a very popular, but very, very special. And they, they change their beers all the time. So and apparently it's a very good beer. I'm not much of a beer drinker, but um, everyone you know, um, I talked to said, yeah, it's a great beer. Um, so basically, building new brewing. Um, the brewery is actually built, um, it was being built, uh, it's due to in July, um, on part of Dunedin Harbour. But the harbour was actually reclaimed from the 1860s. Um, right up until the 1920s. So the site um, where we basically did a whole load of archaeology uh, at depth um, in advance of a very large pipeline going underneath the brewery um, has a very different kind of archaeology. We don't have features, we don't have deposits as such. We have one and a half to two metres deep below. So basically 1.8 metres down you start the archaeology in the sense of cultural field. Um, and then basically have from then down to about three and a half metres uh, below the current ground level um, this rather, you can see it, it shows up, this black, organic, sticky, foul, disgusting, uh, amazing uh, deposit and this thing is a couple of metres deep, it's right onto the original harbour bed, uh, it's all, I'll say it's generally all over the site apart from one area um, and, and we excavated through it basically uh, with a very large machine, um, it's not something you can handy for health and safety but what it is stuff for is artefacts. It was a refuse dump. So basically, from 1890 to 1892, the city deliberately used the city's refuse um, to start the reclamation of this part of the shore. Um, now, this is actually quite common in Dunedin. It's not common in many other places. Uh, there's a little bit of this in Auckland, but um, if you go outside, it's less common in that same um, context. So, what we have in the cultural fill um, are things, truly things. Uh, bottle glass, ceramics, mainly Staffordshire, um, transferware, um, butcher bone, leather footwear. So we're back to wear bottles, our old boots, but we had thousands and thousands. So we ended up taking a sample of a sample of a sample. Um, and I still have 30, 40 old fish bins and that was just, just the process stuff. Um, and I put a wee quote saying that uh, something I just found. Um, slightly out of context but basically it's just a 1900 reference the fact that you know the other end of Dunedin didn't have the blocks ready waiting to be reclaimed to make new man to make money and reclaimed with old boots tin cans and broken bottles about thousands of them so the point of this project is uh, what's the evidence for beer in the archaeological record from Emerson so we're putting the brewery on top and I'm looking for basically evidence of brewing or, or beer consumption underneath 
Um, so the recognition of beer in our factual record, um, we have porters, ales and champagne bottles. I'm going to jump to the champagne because I'm running out of time. Um, is that one of the interesting things about trying to identify beer, beer or beer consumption in the archaeological record is what are you looking for? In our case, we look for bottles because that's what we have. Labels don't survive, paper, painted. We do get some bottle caps, but they're still quite rare. And in this particular context, they didn't survive. You ate, you ate most of the metal, literally. Um, and one of the conundrums we have is there was a massive uh, recycling of bottles in both imported uh, contents and domestic contents in New Zealand. We didn't have glass making until the 1920s, so all of our bottles have come from outside, mainly the UK. One of the key ways to, to bottle beer was actually champagne bottles, quite literally mm -hmm. old champagne bottles. Um, so we find thousands of those. So you find a champagne bottle, what do you think is going to be in it? Champagne. <laughs> I knew it was so wrong. Um, and this is quite an interesting thing that's going on in debate in New Zealand. But I found, I'm just so lucky, um, a great thing. Reed's Bulldog brand, Basel and Guinness's stout in champagne bottles. Can you imagine drinking Guinness out of champagne? Um, it's just, it's just so, I can't, and we have big, big champagne, you know, it's not even just, and we had a lot of champagne bottles. This is subtle in New Zealand. It wasn't, and it was very much, the, you know, I'm going to use the horrible term working class but it was a egalitarian society kind of aim. You know, it had rich people, but the majority of the immigrants were your working class, your miners, um, people making good, people coming to work. They weren't drinking champagne. So the evidence for beer and its social identity, which is a bit of a broad term, and, and I'm probably going to um, run over it a wee bit, but basically, um, with a, generally the shortage of bottle glass in New Zealand, and particularly, uh, you know, in theory, should be reflected in the beer, the beer forms. Uh, that we encounter uh, wasn't found on the site. We had lots of pre deposition broken bottles, all sorts of things. Um, and the fact that we had you know, beer and champagne bottles, which we know documented was, was an accepted <laughs> practice, um, started to question about well, what are we looking for and what kind of identities are we looking for in, in the assemblage as well, and what can it tell us about consumption of beer um, in 19th century New Zealand, especially late. Um, beer is often stereotypes the working man's drink but in New Zealand again because of our more less hierarchical society uh, that was being aimed for um, you know it was very much a middle class drink it wasn't just you know, in fact I think the gin references to gin was very much the, the working man's drink and beer was actually sort of more socially elevated um, arrest rates for drunkenness was much higher than in England but actually even that's now being overturned because a lot of that was to do with the prohibitionist movement uh, and information that came through there in the late 19th century so everything that's been stereotyped about our understanding of beer consumption in New Zealand seems to be changing, and, and it's, a, it's a good thing. Um, and then you have social legal versus health benefits. So you have this dichotomy, this, this, this sort of conundrum of what's the identity of beer when we're looking for it in, in the archaeological record in, in a historical sense. Um, and just, just to, the other side of the social aspect is the fact that you have brewers made good. So brewing, and beer, uh, brewing archaeology isn't just about beers, it isn't just about the breweries, um, it isn't just about the technologies, it's very much about the social context. And I think that you know, a lot of speakers here have sort of mentioned that we need to look beyond just just the, the focus on beer and brewing to actually consumption, to commodity, to very many things. Um, I'm definitely over. So um probably don't I don't know, excuse I'll scoop over this one. So basically um, we've been able to learn through using interdisciplinary approaches historical evidence, archival evidence, archaeological evidence, to actually find out more on that. That's one of the things sort of, you know, we, we're learning in um, New Zealand archaeology, is that we can't just take one approach, we have to use a multiple sort of skilled approach to actually understand what we're doing. And I think, yeah, and I was going to say something about heritage, but I'll actually do it on the panel, so we can wait. Cool. Thank you. Sorry. Thank you.